Welcome to Bible Guru. Thank you for joining us in our journey through the Bible. Genesis chapter 31. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. So the relationships are souring. Things are not going perfectly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Is it possible that because of the tensions, the strife between Jacob and his family, that he actually took the time to pray? We don't really know, but God spoke to him. So even though it seems like Jacob was largely ignoring God for about 20 years, God was not ignoring him. God always had in his mind to bless Jacob. This was his plan and his interest. We may be able to criticize Jacob for many things, but in this case, we see that he was immediately obedient to the guidance of the Lord. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Leah to come into the fields where the flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude toward me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. If he said, the speckled ones will be your wages, then all the flocks gave birth to speckled young. And if he said, the streaked ones will be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked young. So God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. Over the course of time, Jacob realized that it wasn't his manipulations or incantations or use of striped bark that brought him any blessing. It was only God's work that blessed him and prospered him. In breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, and spotted. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here am I. And he said, look up and see all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. This seems to be a separate appearance from the one described at the beginning of this chapter. God continued to speak to Jacob. In fact, it was in the time that he faced the greatest challenges and opposition that he was open to hearing God's voice. It sounds a lot like all of us, I think. Then Rachel and Leah replied, do we still have any share in the inheritance with our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So do whatever God has told you. It's interesting. It looks like Laban's daughters resented him for the way he used them and their marriage to increase his wealth. They also perceived Laban as squandering the abundance and blessings he had received. They also acknowledge God's work in all of this. But we'll see later that Rachel had not moved her heart towards the Lord, while Leah seems to have come to a knowledge and a faith in him. Both grow in their walk with him over time. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padanaram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. I'm sure you've noticed that 
His mother's name isn't mentioned. She had already passed. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel had stolen her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had and crossed the Euphrates River and headed for the hill country of Gilead. There is a good way and many bad ways to do what God tells you. Maybe Jacob was afraid that Laban would argue with him and change his mind like he had the previous time. We know from what Jacob says in a few verses that he was afraid Laban would use force to keep Jacob's wives in Padanaram. We really don't know anything about that or beyond that. But Jacob left without telling Laban that his daughters and his grandchildren were moving. This is obviously not ideal. The relationship between the father and the children had been broken down. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Anytime we see on the third day in the Bible, we need to pay attention because of its connection to the resurrection of Jesus. But I don't see any prophetic pronouncement here. Maybe I'm missing something that's there. But remember that Laban had placed three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and uh, he wanted to be sure that his possessions, especially his spotted and speckled cattle, didn't get mixed up with Jacob's. It would have taken that long, the three days, for the message to get from Jacob's camp and anyone who is watching it on Laban's behalf to Laban to give him the message. The fact that he caught up with Jacob's entourage in only seven days is really quite impressive. They had already been traveling for three days, so they had to keep about double the pace in order to do that. God is fulfilling his promises to Jacob once again, but Jacob doesn't even know it yet. I wonder how often the Lord works on our behalf, and we don't even know it, maybe most of the time. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You've deceived me. You've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing and music and timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You've done a foolish thing. There's no question that Laban is right in what he says here. Whether or not it's true is a different story. It seems unlikely to me that he would have thrown a good, grand going away party for Jacob and his entourage. I have the power to harm you. But last night, the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you longed to return to your father's household. But why did you steal my gods? <laughs> Sorry, I, I read that and I think, okay, why is it that anybody would worship a god that could be stolen? It, to me, there's such irony in that, in that. But we also see here Laban's intent. He said, I have the power to harm you. Why would he have pursued Jacob with those kinds of resources to harm unless he had planned to use them? Were it not for God's intervention, this would have been a very different story. It looks like Laban really intended to do harm to Jacob. Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid because I thought that you would take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, that person shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourselves whether or not there is anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. 
Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Everything about this is wrong. Why did Rachel take these idols? It seems clear that Jacob had not passed his faith on to his family. She had already spoken with the Lord and as a result become pregnant and gave birth to Joseph. It seems like she didn't respond to God's work with an attitude of gratitude and love yet. She's still holding on to these other gods. Why did she steal from her father? Why did she take something, do something so wrong, and keep it from her husband? There's clearly a communication problem in this family, just there, as there had been with Jacob's parents. It seems to be a generational thing that's going on here. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered into Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside of a camel's saddle and was sitting on them. Laban searched through everything in the tent, but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So he searched, but he could not find the household gods. Now Rachel adds more lying to her list of wrongs. <laughs> the excuse that she makes is horrible. One deceit or sin leads to another. Her theft leads to more lies. Then Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. How have I wronged you in all that you have hunted me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and your goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring your animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This is my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for twenty years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. Why is it that we all seem to have a habit of expressing our frustrations only when we get angry? Jacob may have complained about these issues to Laban on a number of occasions, but it seems that their relationship was strained in and ruined by a focus on using each other to accumulate wealth rather than the resources God had blessed them with being a source of joy and communion. They allowed their possessions to possess them and resentment grew over time. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Still, Jacob isn't calling God his own. He still refers to him as Abraham's and Isaac's. Interesting, the poetic reference to the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. This may describe well the differences between Abraham and Isaac's relationship with our Lord. Isaac trembled when he realized that he had attempted to give a blessing that was against God's plans. Abraham laughed and interacted in the presence of the Lord. Jacob, if he's thinking, might ask himself what kind of relationship he would prefer to have with God. We might ask ourselves the same question. Laban answered Jacob, The women are my daughters, these children are my children, and the flocks, all of these, are my flocks. All you see is mine. 
Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or about the children they have borne? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather up some stones. So they took stones and piled them up in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jigur Sahadutha, and Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. This is why it is called Galid. It was also called Mizpah, because he said, May the Lord keep watch between me and you when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, Here is this heap, and here is this pillar I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar on my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So it's really interesting that uh, Laban recognizes that Abraham and Nahor had traveled from Uz years before, uh, decades before, in the previous generations. They traveled together, but Nahor didn't make it all the way to the Promised Land. So it seems that God had not only called Abraham, but also his father to make that journey. It's, it's just interesting. So Jacob and Laban make a covenant, a peace treaty, indicating that they were really not trusting each other at all, um, but also that they promised not to hurt each other. Peace treaties are generally only required between two parties that are at war. A peace treaty in a family. It's really sad. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. He offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they'd eaten, they spent the night there. The fear of Isaac, this name, again, for God, has been used in this passage a few times. We look at it, as I think we should, in a negative light compared to the relationship with Abraham that he had with God. But let's consider the positive side of fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What was Isaac afraid of? It looks like he was afraid of God, which implied that he was not afraid of anything else. But we know that he also feared people and lied, saying his wife was his sister as a result. But in general, if you live in the fear of the Lord, loving him so much that you're afraid to hurt him, you will have the courage, like very few people in history have demonstrated. Millions of believers in God have gone to their graves because they refused to deny the one that gave them life. They were fearless in the presence of kings and people who had power to hurt them. It may not work to call God the fear of Jacob. Would it work to call God the fear of you, your fear? What do you fear? What do you fear? If you truly fear God, you will fear nothing else. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. It's hard not to love a happy ending. Finally, Laban behaves as he should have from the beginning. There are a few lessons that I'd like to talk about from these several chapters, 28, 29, 30, and 31. Number one, God is always faithful to his promises. We need to learn to communicate openly with each other, especially in families. Uh, 
we too often neglect, that fundamental skill that just makes relationships work, the oil in the machinery of life. Three, we're better off when we look to him first, rather than following the ways of the world. Eventually, we have to turn to him. We see this pattern over and over where Jacob does things his own way. Abraham and Sarah did things their own way. But God had his plan. If they had just looked to God first and let him work out his plan, everything would have been better off. Everybody would have been better off. The whole world would have been better off. Eventually, we have to turn to him. We might as well turn to him now. And finally, the fear of the Lord should be our only fear. I think, certainly speaking for myself, I have been afraid of people. I've been in situations where I was afraid. But when I'm really walking with the Lord, close to Him, abiding in Him, consistently just turning to Him moment to moment, as Paul said, pray continually. So when you're not fully engaged in something, you're praying. And even when you're doing things that require a tremendous amount of concentration, like even while I'm making this recording, I'm inside, turning my heart to the Lord, asking for his direction. Um, when I'm singing, which takes a tremendous amount of concentration, I turn my heart towards the Lord and commune with him while creating the music. So it's actually possible, you know, Paul said, pray continually, which implies that you're not in a constant state of prayer. I find it difficult to pray when I'm asleep. Um, I find myself sometimes, you know, I used to bow and, you know, I have this, even now I have a little cushion next to the bed, so I can just kind of roll out of bed and have my knees on the floor. Um, or before going to bed, I can be in that kneeling position. But I, I don't know how many times I've been kneeling down to pray and I've fallen asleep. Um, we need to be in constant communion with God. And, you know, <laughs> if I'm kneeling down and I fall asleep, I'm no longer praying. Um, as close as you can get to be in a constant state of prayer, that should be your state. To be constantly turning everything to the Lord. Lord, what would you have me say here? Lord, thank you. Constantly expressing your appreciation. So much beauty around us. It's a beautiful day. That's when you recognize, you look up at the sky and see how beautiful it is today. You thank the Lord for the beauty of this universe that he's created. And for the gift that we have of being able to enjoy it and to appreciate it for the few brief time that we have on this planet. This kind of communion with God transforms every relationship and makes it so that you're much less likely to live or function based on fear with other people. Because <laughs> to live is Christ, to die is gain. What can a person do to me? Um, temporary suffering is just that, it's just temporary. And you may find that, you know, even if you're thrown in prison or you're suffering, if you're on a hospital bed. I've been on a hospital bed when it's a great time to spend time in prayer because there's nothing else to do with your time. It, it's that communion with God that removes the sting of so many things in our lives. And this is what I think the book of Genesis, all of these stories tell us. When people are in communion with God and they're listening to him and they're abiding with him, life in general goes very differently than it does when they're kind of ignoring him. So thank you all very much for joining us in our journey through the Bible. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.